As I keep saying throughout my gameplay videos, I'm definitely not an authority on Doom mapping. My skills in both editing and playing the game could be described as mediocre at best. However, after mentioning a few things quite often across the wads that I've commented on, I do think I might have some advice about the visual language of Doom levels that at least isn't actively harmful. To help me illustrate my points, I dug out what little I remembered from my university courses on human-computer interfaces, and particularly Don Norman's definition of perceived affordance. While that might sound fairly over the top and pretentious, what Don Norman said really amounted to, things should look like what they are. Or perhaps it's slightly more accurate to say that things should look like they can be used how they're actually used. Before talking about those, I also want to think about the idea of goals in computer interface design. A goal can be very broadly defined, from installing some software to drawing a picture in Paint.net to operating a basic physical appliance to make toast. Within a Doom level, the player knows that their ultimate goal is to get to the level exit, but as they explore the level, they'll find and strive for sub-goals, such as find a way up to that switch and look for the red key. It's up to the map designer to help guide a player, either subtly or blatantly, by presenting a series of sub-goals to them. Those can be switches to push, keys to collect, or simply doors or passageways that invite exploration, and these sub-goals form the rewarding sense of progress through a level. As they aim to complete these sub-goals, the player will subconsciously form up to several million tiny goals, like move towards that health bonus, or shoot that imp over there, or oh dear god get out of the way of that cyberdemon rocket. These sub-sub-goals form the challenge of the level and are determined by how the map is laid out and how it's populated with bonuses and monsters. At all these levels, the user needs to repeat a cycle of actions that will lead them towards the goal at the next level up. Don Norman specifies seven stages of action, but I'm going to simplify them down to just four in the context of Doom. The player has to perceive the choices available to them, then intuit their effects and decide an action to perform on one of those inputs. Then they have to act on whatever they've decided, evaluate the result of their action and repeat that cycle until the goal at the next level up is reached. I'm going to concentrate on the middle layer here, here and talk about ways to help guide players through the map on their way to reaching the level exit. From a human-computer interface perspective, the UAC labs and hell are interesting places. In the real world, the aim of good interface design is to let a user achieve a goal with the minimum hassle possible. However, within Doom, things work very differently. You don't want the interface the player explores in the game world to objectively be a good one, because having a perfect interface where everything works as planned would take away the difficulty and surprise of the game. In real-world interfaces, if you put a single button next to a door, you're probably signalling that pressing that button opens the door. In Doom, equally, the button could open the rest of the room except the door and cause you to be eaten alive by demons. Setups like these are an example of increasing the difficulty of the intuit step to catch the player off guard and keep them interested with unexpected results. In the same way, if a player has identified their next goal, but is thwarted by a reasonable number of unexpected obstacles in clever ways while they're attempting to act on it, they'll generally enjoy themselves more. Increasing the difficulty of the intuit and act steps is generally what makes a level more exciting and challenging. However, if a player has difficulty finding out where they should go next or what actions are available to them because they can't discover what pulling a switch did, they'll be standing around stuck and not having a good time. Put another way, to make a level play well instead of frustratingly, the player needs to be aware of all the actions available to them so that they can decide on their goals, but not to know exactly what's going to happen when they get there, or even what's going to happen along the way. So with all that theoretical science in mind, here are some small practical pieces of advice about helping a player through a level by thinking about how you present their possible actions and the results of them through the choices you make in your map design. Doors should look like doors. If a texture is to be openable by the player through a line def action, it should look like a door, unless of course the hiddenness is the point to access a secret area and so on. To make a map flow more pleasantly for the player, try to stay consistent in your use of texturing for doors that are openable and things that are used as decoration. If a texture is used for a door that's directly openable by pushing on it, the same texture shouldn't then be used for a door that's just for decoration or is opened via a remote switch. If a door looks like an unlocked one the player has tried before, they'll expect to be able to open it.
The GZ Doom game Blade of Agony handles this by making doors that are purely decorative dark grey and having other colours on the openable doors. In a game like this, where the players spend so much time in realistic looking settings, this gives the mappers a lot more freedom to make their environments without inspiring the player to try every door handle in the building. Another example in the iWads is that the door 3 texture throughout episode 1 of Doom is almost always just used for decoration at the level entrance and is unopenable. There are a couple of exceptions in maps 4 and 5, but John Romero uses other visual cues here to indicate that the door isn't just for decoration this time. By putting the coloured key indicator texture around them, it hints that the door can be opened this time with the use of the correct key. Speaking of which, if a door requires a key, this should be made obvious. The coloured door border textures are traditionally used for this, but in some situations it's possible to use torches or other decorative items, or even using custom textures for the doors themselves. Other textures that happen to be blue, red or yellow, such as light blue and red wall 1, can be ambiguous and should be avoided around doors and switches. If you're just using the iWOD textures, you're fairly limited in your selection of doors, but if you're using OTEX, I really like using the ODOR D textures, which look like roll-top garage doors for remote doors, and the ODOR A and ODOR E textures for openable ones. Vanilla doesn't really have any doors that are obviously only openable remotely, but I tend to use the Tech Bron textures as they somewhat resemble the big door doors while still being obviously wall-like. Perhaps you could also use a trim around the door to indicate that it's opened elsewhere, in a similar vein to the coloured key border textures. Switches should look pressable. A switch is a prime target for a player. It's a promising position that they want to reach because they know it's going to have some sort of effect on the map and promises to bring them closer in some way to their ultimate goal. To make that promise clear to the player, it should have some visible button handle or decoration that looks like it can be pushed, moved or otherwise fiddled with. It should also be obvious when a switch can be interacted with versus when the player has pushed a switch already, so that the player doesn't mistake a pulled switch for a new one or the other way round. This way you lower the player's difficulty in perceiving the actions available to them. Switches typically have two textures, beginning with the characters SW1 and SW2, that toggle between each other when the switch is pressed. The switch textures in Vanilla Doom come in five different types. LED switches that are dark in SW1 and lit up in SW2. Hellish switches that are dark in SW1 and lit up in SW2. Levers that are up in SW1 and down in SW2. Tech switches with both lights and levers that are red in SW1 and green in SW2, and SW1 pipe. Inconsistently with everything else, SW1 pipe uses the grey lever patch pointing down for SW1 and up for SW2. This has a lot of potential for confusion because when it hasn't been switched it looks like the player has already pulled it. As a result I avoid using it, or I use the SW2 variant in my maps instead of SW1 as in everything else, so that it's visually consistent with other switches. Otherwise, using the SW2 variants of switches is discouraged in maps because the player is used to those textures indicating that they've already found and switched them. It might not matter in small maps, but once you're dealing with complex maps that double back on themselves and use many buttons and levers, it's easy for the player to lose track and be fooled by some bad texture choices like this. Occasionally you might want a switch to represent turning something off instead of on, but I would still avoid using SW2 switches unless your map has some scripting or some other context that makes it clear to the player that they're supposed to interact with it. If you're using custom switch textures, it's useful to make sure the switch stands out as a switch by following the sort of conventions established by the default ones. I'm also going to use my position here to encourage you to try to include a visual change in the texture beyond just changing red to green to assist colourblind players like me, although you would frankly be astonished at how often I forget to do this myself. Where you put a switch can be just as important as what it looks like. To help the player accurately perceive their possible actions, you should always try to make the player aware of the presence of switches, especially if they're vital to the progress of the game, they should be very visible and not tucked out of the way where the player has to hunt for them. Memento Mori 2 has a sticking point near the beginning where you're lost in a rocky area and you have to notice a very slight indentation in one of the walls to find the switch needed to let you out. This would work very well as a secret, but as a required switch it's a frustrating and confusing hunt. Though it came out a generation later than Doom, it would be a massive oversight not to also mention Hexen 2 here, the queen mother of hidden buttons and switches where the player has to scour every inch of every map, banging on walls with a hammer, or risk being reduced to running round in circles with no path forward.
To make sure that players don't have to hunt for switches, you should have them plainly visible from at least one main route into a room, even if they can't be reached directly by the player immediately. For some other ideas, you could perhaps make the wall textures around them different from the rest of the room so that they stand out more, or use sector lighting or dynamic lights if that works for your map and the format you're working in. It's also polite to make switches non-repeatable if they can only be activated once, so that the player doesn't mistake them for a button that might do something again. Without the repeatable flag, a switch will stay on its activated texture to indicate it's no longer a target for the player. Shootable switches should look shootable. This is a tricky one, because to be honest, no texture in Doom looks shootable. For that reason, I would almost always discourage the use of gun-type line def actions, unless you can find a way to make it dumbfoundingly obvious to the player that this is what they need to do to progress, and I'll talk a bit more about introducing new concepts at the end of the video. There are, however, a couple of ways you can cue the player here. The first of them is to put the switches down at the end of a tight pipe-like sector where they can't possibly be reached without shooting them. This will at least hint to the player that they're meant to perform some sort of different action to the switch that isn't just walking up and pressing it. The other is to use custom textures that have an appearance that prompts the player better. I tend to follow the appearance of Quake 1's shootable switches and make them pulsing red and target-like. This should be enough for the player to recognise that this is a new kind of switch that requires an aiming kind of action. Bars should behave like bars. Doom is mostly limited to sectors that move up and down, so talking about doors and switches covers a lot of actions that the player can cause on the map. But there are also a couple of other interactive elements that you'll see fairly often. As an alternative to a door, a doorway could have bars across it to block the way, and it's hard to make them look to a player like they can be opened directly. Famously, Doom 2's Underhalls had this problem, where players in 1994 were confronted with a set of silver bars early on, and were unsure how to get them out the way. Nothing like this had appeared in the iWads before this point, so players thought they would have to be opened remotely, and the thought of just walking up to them and pressing use didn't occur to them. For that reason, they were removed from later versions of the iWOD. I also ran into the same issue on the map called Attack from the Master Levels while casually getting footage to run in the background of this video. The tall bars don't look like they're openable at all, and so I spent a long time wandering around Lost before I thought to try them. Bars that are openable with a key, like the ones on the other side of the same room in Underhalls, can be made a bit more clear, but not really by much. Here, and in the map later on called Nirvana, they're made with the door indicator textures directly on the columns themselves, and they're opened by the player pressing Use. Columns like these are the only times when the player has to press Use on an actual door trim texture to open something, and I don't really like that because of its inconsistency with normal doors. Because of the ambiguity that directly openable bars cause, as well as the potential for misfiring the open key between the line defs and accidentally thinking that they're unopenable, I would recommend only using bars that can be opened remotely, and clearly marking the switch that connects to them. As an alternative, one or more of the bars could be made wider with a visible switch on them to indicate to the player that this is something that should be used directly. Movable platforms should look movable. Platforms are a little more difficult still, and are an interesting case because in the iWads they're illustrated fairly oddly with textures that mean different things in different places. There's the Plat 1 texture, of course, which is nice and clear, but often a platform that can be pulled down to get you out of harmful liquid, for example, will have the Support 2 or Support 3 texture on it. It's interesting that in different contexts, these textures mean completely different things to a Doom player. If they're on very narrow lines, they're just being used as a visual border between different wall textures, and if they're very wide, they're likely under a walkway that isn't usable. It's just in the in-between case, where a support texture is not too wide but not too narrow either, that Doom players will see them as textures to try pressing. Therefore, if you want to indicate a platform that can be pulled down, the only consistent thing seems to be that it should be different from the non-usable walls around it. And you can cue the player a bit more by using a texture that has a vertical stripe pattern like the Support 2 and Support 3 textures do. Teleports should look... teleporty. I've touched on this idea a bit already, with the idea of switches looking pressed and unpressed and the various types of doors. The idea is that a player should be able to tell how something can be interacted with based on what it looks like, along with what they've experienced before. But as well as walls, the player also has some limited interaction with floors. One of the reasons you might use a specific flat is to indicate to the player that it will cause them to teleport. 
Teleportation is actually triggered by the player moving across a line, but the flat used behind that line is usually important to the player's interpretation. The standard for teleports in the iWads is to use the gate textures, although there are several others that can also do the job if you decorate them well enough. The idea is that the player should be able to recognise that this is a thing that invites stepping into. This is important for telling the player where they can go to make progress in the level, but in the case of traps, sometimes you'll want a teleporting line that has no warning at all. I tend to use the red gate textures for active teleport, and the white gate 4 texture for indicating a teleport destination that doesn't teleport the player back again, but this is up to your own preference. Floor damage should be consistent. Another place where consistency isn't always guaranteed is in damaging floor textures, and this can be particularly annoying because there's no way for a player to tell if a floor is damaging, or by how much, without stepping onto it. From a mapper's point of view, the appearance of a floor doesn't have any bearing on its assigned effect. It's very possible to have a normal looking floor damage the player, or a lava floor be perfectly safe, either by design or by accident. To help a player along, the floors that cause damage and the amount of damage they apply should both be consistent across your wad. I was curious about how the original Doom used them, and it turns out it makes them behave like this. Water never damages you. Mud never damages you. Nukage damages you by 5 points per second, blood by 10 points per second, and lava by 20 points per second. I was interested to discover that there are also some special cases where areas with damaging floors that can't be escaped do higher amounts of damage than they would normally, so as not to prolong the player's death. You can see this most obviously in Toxin Refinery, where the escapable hole of the famous donut is less damaging than the fatal outside. Whether you think inescapable areas should exist is another question entirely. Personally, I prefer to allow the player an escape route, but you might decide that if a player falls into a big pit of lava, it's their own big stupid fault. Most of these damaging floors are generally agreed upon by the mapping community, but the blood flats present a bit of an issue. Some mappers think they should be damaging, as the Doom Manual indicates it's boiling blood, others don't and use it as a harmless liquid floor. Similar arguments can be made around the lava-filled rocks and the blue circles in rails in the floor in Doom Episode 2 that I suppose are meant to be live wires or radioactive or something. All the advice I can give here is really to be consistent throughout your level or wad with which floors are damaging and which aren't, and to try to make any texture look dangerous and like something you don't want to drop into if it's going to harm you. Beat the player over the head with new concepts. So far, I've talked about things that are all existing parts of the language of Doom's default maps, and for which players will come in with expectations already in mind. But sometimes you'll want to introduce a new idea that isn't present anywhere in the original Doom maps. If you've done this, and there's a new mechanic in your level that the player will be unfamiliar with, metaphorically grab their head, spin them round to face it, and shout, LOOK AT THIS! Never leave it to trust that they'll get it on their own. John Romero did this perfectly in Sigil with the shootable eye switches, which were achieved by using a line def action behind them with a gun-type trigger. In the very first room of the ward, the player is stuck in a small space with an eye decoration that they can't reach slotted into a wall, and there's no way forward until they eventually decide to shoot it. Almost immediately afterwards, there's another one, and the player observes the same effect from shooting that. This teaches them that these things are going to act as switches throughout the map set, and prompts them to look for them. If the map had instead introduced this mechanic in the middle of a level, the player would have got frustrated exploring every corner trying to find a way forward that they recognised, be it a switch or a door or even a secret passage. Shooting the eye, in amongst all the other possibilities, wouldn't even have crossed their minds. The courtyard in Doom 2 paradoxically does this really badly even though it presents the player with almost the exact same scenario. It starts the player off in a small room with no obvious exits, and they can't progress until they've worked out the new mechanic of having to shoot the door to open it. This is bad for three reasons. It comes very late in the game after no previous indication that shootable switches even existed. There are a couple of secrets activated that way, like the one all the way back in Doom 1 E1M2, but no essential level progression. Secondly, the same texture has been used before to indicate a door that's directly openable by the player, causing unnecessary confusion when they find they can't open it this time. If the door had a unique texture, it might prompt the player to try different things this time. 
But most of all, the introduction of this mechanic goes nowhere. Unlike the eye switches in Sigil becoming a repeating theme of the level set, this setup never appears again and the player doesn't get to learn anything from it. If the wad, or even just that one level, had further doors or switches you had to shoot, the beginning of the level might have been a useful introduction to the idea, but as it is, it's thrown out as soon as it arrives and remains an odd and cumbersome stumbling block. In other custom WAD scenarios, one of the slightly more common new mechanics is using the flat computer console textures as switches. This was used as a secret in one place in Doom 2, but if you're going to do this as part of the required route through your level, make sure the player knows that this is going to happen from very early on, before a map opens up with too many options. Knee Deep in Zen Doom does this at the start, with the option of having a huge great arrow hovering above the computer, which I would argue is really a sign that this might not be recognisable to the player alone and is therefore a bad idea. In a smaller way, this rule can also apply to any custom textures that represent switches or doors in your WAD. To help the player enjoy themselves, make sure that they at least know what they're looking for. Get and act on feedback. Finally, and possibly the most valuable thing you can do while making a Doom level or any game design, is to pay attention to feedback. Designing an environment to guide the player gently through a large and complicated map is a delicate balance, as you don't want them to feel railroaded or being led by the hand, but you also don't want them to run around lost for ten minutes. From its very early days, Doom came with a great tool to study how players explored and interacted with maps in the form of recorded demo files, which could be played back on another person's computer. FDAs, or first demo attempts, were very small files because they were just lists of instructions, and they were widely shared by players of maps on the old Doom groups. They were very useful for mappers to see how new players experienced the maps without knowledge of what was coming, and people are still doing this today, either through sharing similar demo files or screen recording them and putting them on video services. If you can, ask people you know, or the people offering that service on the various Doom forums, if they can record first-time demo attempts before you make the final release of your map, as even seeing one player walk through your environment for the first time can be very helpful. Equally, you can try out other people's maps yourself, and think about what you see in them, the things in them that work, and the things that don't. I find people who provide a running audio commentary along with the video particularly helpful, but some people can be shy about this, so it's definitely not a requirement. Just noting any sticking points is a very valuable thing to do. If you're seeing a player get stuck somewhere in your map, don't dismiss it as their own problem even if the path forward seems obvious to you. Think about why something was unclear to them, and how to signpost things a little better without forcing their hand. You'll quickly find that players, being the awkward creatures that they are, will always think of something you didn't, so you might also find that you want to add responses to things the player does that you hadn't thought of the first time round. At the same time, don't feel you have to take all your tester's advice if it doesn't suit your own intent. I've seen people do ridiculous speedrun shortcuts on some of my maps, and I've tended to leave those in as long as doing the shortcut is harder than playing the map the normal way. So that, in 20 minutes, is some of my advice for thinking about how the visuals in a Doom map communicate to the player and guide them along the way to make a map flow more smoothly. If you have any other rules you abide by when designing levels, I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Doom mapping is one of the most satisfying methods of level design I've ever used, proved by the way that I made an entire demo museum map for this video when I could have just scoured existing Doom maps for examples, and it's something I love to help people get into.